pretty cool. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> yours no I, I, yeah, I would have tried to play your vibe, but I, I couldn't really nail it. So I just did my yeah, own awesome. outside <laughs> kind of thing on it. Anyway, there you go, the yours no But listen, man, uh, nice to meet you, and thanks so much for doing this. Uh, if it's all right with you, I w I'd really like to talk about your new album, but I I've got a few things I took down. Uh, a solo you did on I Feel Good, that great record where Chris Potter takes the other solo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You play a killer solo on that. I mean, it was a beast to transcribe. Um, and there's some killer stuff. So I wouldn't mind taking a minute to talk about the things that I thought were in there and what you thought about that. But, sure, sure, sure. But if you don't mind, I, I'm curious to hear about the, the new album because I, I checked out all the things you're on. I thought this is really exciting. There's all that. Um, solo guitar intro stuff i just wondered if you could just speak about that for a minute that you know how you came to do it and the approach to getting it together yeah well the way the story behind this record is um during the pandemic in 2020 once we were out of uh lockdown which was about somewhere in may um I wanted to play you know and there was nowhere everything was closed you couldn't do anything you couldn't meet people at houses so I live right by next to two parks, Central Park and Riverside Park. And so I thought, you know, if I get a transit, like a, a battery amp, I'll just go to the park and play. And there's there's a really great bass player that lives by me. His name is Ugano Cuego. And then there's a really good drummer by me named Ray Merchika. And they were all in the neighborhood. So I thought, you know, what the hell? Let me call them. Maybe they want to play. So they wanted to, and we've done it from the end of May till the end of October when it got cold. Mm. So we would go to the park like two to three times a week and play standards. And it was great because I, I never played that much standards in my life. Like I play jazz all the time, but not like that. So we kind of got a, some kind of repertoire and we also start to get a vibe because you play like two, three times a week. Yeah. On top of the fact that it was so liberating because you were outside, the weather was nice and you know, no mask, we were just kind of playing and people were walking by kind of looking at us like we're a bunch of monkeys, you know. <laughs> but that's what the story. So what happened is at the end of it, when it starts to get cold, Ray said like, hey, let's just go in the studio and record our album. And that's what we did. So all we did was just try to create the vibe that we had in the park. And we didn't, but it turned out good. <laughs> yeah, really good. Really, really good. Yeah, so that's pretty much the story behind it. Now, the thing about me that a lot of people probably don't know or don't really get is I've been, this is not new for me. I just never did a jazz album. I've been playing jazz quartets and trios in New York for years. Like I've been playing the 55 bar, this kind of stuff for a really, really long time. I just never recorded it, you know, and that was kind of a good opportunity. Hopefully I'll do some more of that, uh, but, but that's really the story behind it. You yeah. Know? I mean, I thought it was interesting. Let's say the, the solo guitar thing. I was trying to, I mean, I, you know, you've got your own style. You're a serious, serious artist. You've got your own thing, which, you know, every, every time I look at your stuff there, you've got a, your own thing in all, in all elements, but I was trying to put my finger on what might be the influences for the solo guitar thing. Cause, um, there was a very when you're talking about solo guitar, you're talking about those intros that like I did. Intros. Yeah, the intro things, you know, because um, years ago, I, you probably know that that um, I think Schofield did a version of that with like a solo guitar intro, and his version sounded a bit like Keith Jarrett had done a version. Obviously, it's a piano, so it's not a single note, single line yeah. thing, but that kind of uh, sort of freewheeling kind of thing, rather than chord supporting a a tune thing. I just wonder what what what's in your where does your bag of tricks come through with the solo guitar intros? Well, here's the thing. First of all, the biggest challenge of my life is playing solo guitar. I don't, I do not know how to play solo guitar. I still think about it all the time and how can I do it and what concept. The reason why I never really attempt is because it's so limiting when you play solo guitar. And I don't want to get into this whole thing with all these weird techniques that limits you and you have to work on it forever. Like I'm, I want to be able to improvise free freely like I improvise over a standard, but with playing solo. So the first, the, the one thing that I did, um, again, it goes back to the pandemic for a weird reason, but 
I start when again when the, everything was still kind of locked down. I would I started to put these videos on Instagram where I would put a metronome in two and four, and I would improvise, just like there was a band behind me. Yeah, and I people really liked it. I used to ma- I kind of made an exercise of it every week. I would choose a tune and I would practice and then record a bunch of takes. So that's kind of how I approach solo guitar. I don't. I, I tr- because it's so limited technically, I try to avoid the technical limitation, meaning like playing those weird chords and playing bass line while playing the guitar, the lines. That's something that, you know, Charlie Hunter can do that, but nobody else, you know? Oh, hold on, sorry. Sorry, you can cut that off. So, so the thing is, um, I don't have a concept yet for solo guitar. All I would say is those intros, like for Billy's Bounce, it was just me playing the melody. But all those intro, you want that intro for all the things you are, it's just basically me playing over the changes. And maybe I'll try to highlight the bass note or something. But I try to have, I try that none of that will influence my lines. And that's a real problem. That's why I never really figure out a solo guitar thing yet i'm still kind of thinking about it it sounds it sounds just really solid you know uh i mean it's a whole thing thing where i see i don't like to plan things like there's a lot of people that play solo guitar and they 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 compose it Hmm. and it's gorgeous there's amazing stuff and you know with the fingers like this and all that kind of stuff yeah. It's amazing, but it's not what I want to do. I want to be able to do it spontaneously, like with some ideas in the background, obviously. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because planning it and making it like writing it, that's not improvisation. It's great as a composition, but it's not improvisation. So that's why I've been having a hard time with it. And I only do like little intros or outros maybe, but that's it. I haven't really figured it out yet. But I mean, it's, it's, I'm surprised to hear you say that you feel like that because it's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful as it is, you know, it's, it's a breathing, breathing, it's really lovely. And that's one of the things when I was trying to put a, like put my finger on it, as I say, I know you've got your own thing and I, I would expect when you do something, you put your stamp on it, but it's like a parallel. I, it sounded to me like a parallel to the way that Bill Frizzell plays things. Maybe, I, maybe. Um, I, I checked out a little bit of a few different versions of him just playing that old Americana tune, Shenandoah. It's a very simple <laughs> tune. And it, I noticed that he's kind of building it from the ground. He's kind of doing what you're doing. He's thinking on his feet, basically. Yeah, of course. And it's just that kind of confidence. So it, it, what you did sounded a lot like that to me. It's like just letting letting your musicianship come out and going with your instinct. And yeah, I'd be interested to hear different versions of it. But anyway, that's that was my question. How much of that was kind of pre thought out? You know, no, so, good, good. I mean, it, it's so lovely. It's great really great you know i come up i come i came up with the whole you know with the real improvisers you know like kid jared is like the top of it because he just improvised from his head but you know that's what i try strive to you know those kind of guys or chicoria or herbie you know those guys so if i could in some way have a little bit of that freedom you know what i mean within the tune that i'm playing that's the goal you know yeah yeah I mean, if I, if you don't mind me referring to this solo, I did, uh, I, mean, sure. I could have slaved over it a bit more, but there's a couple of things in this, I feel good solo that really blew my mind. It's like you expect it from, you know, the cover band idea of what that James Brown original is. And yeah. you're going to put your own thing. There's a bit when you, you play on what I'm expecting to be D seven and then you play. And then the next. I love that. It's I don't like, remember this solo at all. Um, it's really fast. It's really, I mean, it's it? an amazing solo. It's just wow, thank you. But, but uh, you, oh, it's, that blew my mind. When I sat down, to, I thought, i got to transcribe something. I need to get a solid hold of something, you know. And when I took that down, I was listening to it, I thought, what's he playing there? And I thought, oh, it's a D major scale he's starting with. It's like that thing in a, in a blues in C, you know, where in like this, uh, seventh bar when you go back to the one chord it's like that bebop thing that bebop players would play major seven whereas a lot of people would play a dominant seven so you go one oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. or one but can be one major seven. i thought yes, yes. you did that but it just blew my mind i i don't know what that says about me but that i thought that was really surprising and then you 
you know, you proceed before, and then you go into this diminished thing. And I'll tell you, the next thing I noticed is that you're playing like a C minor pentatonic kind of thing over A7. So my question is, my number C minor pentatonic over A7. Yeah, okay. so it gives you like the sharp nine, sharp four, flat 13, seven, flat nine kind of thing. Yeah. So you're doing this kind of, there's, oh, the guitar's a bit quiet, but whatever. Uh, it almost sounds like, um, I don't know, more jazzy Robin Ford kind of thing. But you do that kind of device a couple of times. My question is simply, do you do you think about um, like codifying what pentatonic scales go over what chords? Is that something you've studied, or or have you just made up an approach with that in in your ears kind of thing? I think the the short answer for it, it first of all, I I have to kind of probably listen to the solo and go like, oh, maybe that was this, maybe that was that. But um, I think the short the short answer for it is that. You know, when I practice, so when you come up with concepts, you you kind of have tools that you're going to use for improvising. So, you know, we have harmony, which is chords, and then we have a melody, which is, in my case, more scales than triads or arpeggios. To me, I kind of got into that part. I'm only kind of getting to playing more like over with triads and arpeggios now, believe it or not. I was always more like scales kind of a guy, you know? Yeah. So there was those, those tools that you can use over a dominant chord. You know, there's a mixolydian scale, halton scale, altered scale, blah, 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 um, diminished scale. And then the same thing goes for pentatonic. You know, what pentatonic can work on an A7 chord, you know? Yeah. So I have all those tools, you know what I mean? Like I have it in mind. I kind of know how it sounds because a big part of it is how you, how your ear kind of relates to that like you have to know how the thing sounds you know if you just think about it and you don't know how it sounds then that's not a good thing so i have those concepts and then when i improvise i don't really think about that but i i don't i don't play by ear but i try to improvise with my ear so maybe so meaning i'm trying to develop melodies and move from you know with those tools that i have I, I just move over different harmony harmonies or like scales and stuff so that's where it's coming from so i would say that probably again i would have to look into the solo but i would probably think about certain scales that work and then i develop melodies and within those melodies i move from one thing to the next and i try to create melodies that you know like move from one thing to the next you know so yeah. it's hard for me to explain exactly. I would have to listen, look, look at the line and go like, oh, this is maybe what I was thinking. But in general, that's kind of how I approach it or that's the tools that I use to get where I'm going, you know? And another thing that's really important is the whole rhythmical approach where um, I don't know if in this specific solo it's highlighted, but there's a big part to your phrasing that has to do with the rhythms that you play and how you play those rhythms and that's a big deal so because you know like if you if you don't think about rhythms while you're playing it's very stale it's it almost sounds like you can play the greatest stuff but it's just not going to sound like it's not going to reach anywhere you know yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. i mean that's that's interesting that you think of scales because now i come to think of it that just by the by that that pentatonic you can see it as a pentatonic or you can just see it as hang on a minute it's just a nice shape with a knee altered, I guess. Yeah. So Maybe. If you're finding good shapes. You don't know giving it quite the same names, but I, I would think sometimes of, of arpeggios too. But but you know, it's a mix of everything together, and um, I can't say that when I'm soloing, I actually think about that stuff. But sometimes I would. Sometimes I would. Go, sometimes like oh, altered will come into my head, so I'll go for something like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. But you have to, you know, you have to not only know the scale all over the neck and all stuff, but you also have to understand the sound of it and what it, what it sounds in relation to the chord that you're playing over. You know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's so so clear that you, you're hearing all this sort of stuff. You know, there's there's a as it goes on, there's a lovely thing over D7. I'm going to murder this line for you. Let me just destroy this line that you play. <laughs> you can't play this thing again. So. <laughs> well, 
so this is over D7, right? So you're yeah. playing like like an E, E. It's almost like E bebop for a second, which is like just Lydia. Yeah. Oh, man, what a shape. And then... Oh, oh, it's pretty good, pretty good actually. I don't know what made me think that line. That's like. Uh, you know, Matheny's solo on, on nothing personal from Michael Brecker's first record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brings me to another question. I don't really hear. Uh, I mean, you, as I say, I don't want to insult you by by not making clear that. To everybody that grasp your style is so personal it's, it's i love it it's great it's thank you it's, you know none of it is a tribute to anybody else but did you did you check out any Matheny when you were younger did you transcribe any Matheny is the reason why i play guitar but i never transcribed pat Matheny. Oh. i never it's pretty really interesting i never transcribed pat i never transcribed skull i never transcribed frizzell i never transcribed stern i never i I transcribed only a tiny bit of Scott Henderson when I was just growing up, but really not. So all those guys that are kind of, let's say I'm heavily influenced by from that era, I never transcribed. And one of the reasons for it was because at the time I couldn't figure it out. It was too hard for me. And then I went to a teacher in Israel when I was growing up that got me into bebop. And he says like, you know, if you want to play all this modern stuff, study bebop. And that's what I transcribed to death. Like I used to be a West Montgomery clone. So a lot of a lot of my 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 vocabulary just comes from bebop, really, you know. And and then I just because I I guess I learned some of the more modern tricks, I applied that into it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean that's like there's a lovely thing in this song just before that D D major thing. You're on G seven and then you're just targeting D seven and this there's this killer line. <laughs> Which is a like a bebop sort of like. A lot of my lines are bebop lines. Yeah, my but it's, it's so great because it's actually a secondary dominant. So you're playing like A7 yeah. going to D7, but the underlying chord is G7. It's, oh, it's great. You know, a lot of times, what happens a lot of times, I talked about it. I talk about it a lot when I do master classes and stuff like that. You know, I there there's kind of this conception, uh, like people think that um, perception that. There's a perception that, you know, you know, fusion music or whatever you call it, or jazz music is really complicated. And then, you know, they listen to certain tunes, let's say, of mine, and there's little twists and turns in the heads, and they go like, oh, it's hard music. But in reality, when you play on the, this solo, when I improvise, I use pretty simple chord changes, and it's pretty straight. It just has to groove. So um, I like to play not only within the changes but also over the changes meaning like kind of playing over the whole movement and that's something that i think somebody that's a master at that is a kid jerry because he's kind of playing over the tune you know yeah so that sometimes leads to this kind of stuff where i'll resolve something later or even if it goes to g let's say i'm going to still think about a because it's a big in the bigger picture it's a bigger it's more of that sound so that that's kind of and I, I I try to do that a lot with standards too. Where, for example, the standards on the on the Riverside record um, are tunes that I feel comfortable playing that way. That I don't like that the the harmony the the changes don't restrict me. You know what I mean? So I can play exactly on the changes or over the changes, meaning kind of like around and. That's what I like to do. So I think that's a part of what you hear, and you know, it's kind of me, kind of moving around, you know. Yeah, I mean, that's it's so definite. You know, it's it's so obvious that you, you've got these. I mean, there's no all the phrasing is so definite. It's, it's really great. You know, it's, you've got yeah. all these tool. Your toolkit is all polished and ready to go. It's really amazing. So the, while we're talking about piano players, what did you learn from Chick Corea? I know he, he you know, you had him on one of your tracks well i i never played played with him he just played on a track on my record yeah um 
you know, he's like basically my probably my biggest influence, you know, in music. So I, there's nothing I can say that wasn't said about him. The only thing I can tell I can say I tell a funny story where, well, actually I'll tell two things. One is I did look at his master classes because he was doing before he passed away. He was doing those master classes, oh, and really? I, okay. yeah, and I watched a few of them, and I gotta say, he was an awful teacher. <laughs> like really awful and i kind of went like you know some of those old school guys they invented the stuff so in their head this is what it is but they don't really know how to give it to us like the humans in a way where you can digest it and and so i remember looking at this stuff go like you gotta be kidding me that doesn't help me at all and i was really hoping for but 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 it also showed me that you know those guys figure out stuff in their head and how they play and then universities came and wrote the books on it and probably inter inter interpretate some of it wrong actually yeah sure yeah. you know so because some guy called i remember he was doing question and answer this guy called was like oh what are you playing on that subdominant alter blah 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 on this and, and chick looked at him goes like i don't know what you're talking about what is that you know so it's kind of interesting but the other funny story is when i sent him this track to play on there was a diminished chord there and I was I had a hard time playing on it myself sometimes you write something you hear it but you don't know what to do with it and he called me when he was doing the track I was like hey that diminished is fucking me up what is this I was like well I don't know your chick Koreas figure it out <laughs> but I can't make me feel good because like okay I'm not the only one that's uh, yeah. <laughs> amazing oh fantastic yeah. do, you know that, do you know that record of his um now he sings now he sings. Mm -hmm. oh, oh man the greatest oh, fantastic i love that record yeah it's amazing so listen i i you know i've i've written a load of stuff i've discerned i i don't want to waste your time you got all the you get it's all cooking and you're playing so, i just ask whatever you want i got time i no, i tell you i wouldn't mind talking about groove playing so you play with yeah. will lee a lot it was, yes every, everybody loves will lee's playing what what do you learn from playing with Willie? What have, what have you learned over the years from playing with him? Um, I'll tell you, it's not it's not directly towards him. Is because I can talk about him for an hour. Um, when I moved to there's there's when I moved to New York, the one thing that impacted me the most was I started to play with players that had really good grooves. Like when you play with a really good drummer that is like the real guy, you know, like, I don't know, at the time, the first time I played with Anton Fig or somebody like that, or like Keith Carlock, or then you get into like the Cayudas or Weckl or something, or Steve Ferroni, for example. The thing about that is you can't experience that in any way unless you play with those guys. It's a certain feeling that you can't grab from a record. So when I came from Israel in the mid nineties here, I listened to all these records, but only when I actually played with those guys, I realized, I remember one of the things I did, I did a, I did a masterclass with John Robinson, JR. And I remember we were playing all these like Michael Jackson things. And it just, it sounded just like the record. And I was like, wow. And it, you know, it feels great. And then the next day, a friend of mine, really good drummer, tried to play the same groove and it sounded a little, nothing like it, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, so the thing about all the, the whole idea about groove and pocket and is a lot of it has to do with you have to actually play with those guys to understand what it is. And only when you understand what it is, then you can see where you are in the equation. Meaning, if I play with Steve Ferroni and Will Lee, you know, it's got a very specific pocket. It feels unbelievable. It's something that you can't experience unless you're actually playing with them. But it also tells you where you are. It, like, do you play behind? Do you play in the middle? Do you play back? You know what I mean? Kind of puts you in the middle. So I, I was fortunate since I moved to New York to play with a lot of these guys all the time. So now it's just normal to me. But it's, it's something that, you know, the whole idea about rid of and pocket it it's pretty much like if you don't have that well you can't really play music that will feel good you know yeah. so that's one thing and again playing with will or uh, playing with will is like to me it's like the he's like the perfect bass player but um 
but any of those great guys, even the guys that have chops like Dennis Chambers or Weckl or Vinny or all those guys, it's not about their chops. It's about the way their groove feels. It was never about their chops. Like it is for kids or for people that like the gymnastics, but it's the way their groove feels and their musicality. That's why they're as great as they are, you know? Yeah, sure. The other part of rhythm, the other part of rhythmical of like the rhythm aspect is rhythmical playing and that's a different thing that's what that's how you interpreted rhythms in your grooves in your plan and that's something really strong that really important and strong that a lot of guitar us guitar players are kind of lacking because nobody really talks to guitar players about groove and rhythmical plan and all that kind of stuff you know yeah 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 so how did you fall into playing with Will Lee as often as you do then? How did you first run across When him? I moved to New York, uh, I got lucky. Some it, There was some club in Midtown that I went and jammed, and the guy liked me for some reason. So he gave me a weekly gig there, and it went on, not a weekly, a monthly gig. And I, I started to have one or two gigs a month that I could play my band. You know, it was it was pretty much I always wrote music, but it was before I kind of became like my actual record. So um, I started to do those gigs and they paid a little bit. So I was able to hire guys. So I started to hire, you know, like Anton Fig, Keith Carlock, all those guys. I don't know. I remember Mark Egan play with me, like a bunch of those cats in New York, you know, sure. and um, I remember trying to get Will, but he wasn't into it early on. But oh, but but I also didn't have real original music yet. And then when I started to write an original music, I did a live album. The first record I did was live at the bitter end. And when he heard that I've done it, I think he probably listened to it. And then he was like, "Oh, call me to play with you." And that's been I don't know by now it was twenty years. Yeah, yeah, something like that. So <laughs> excuse me, when you do parts, when you when you're doing an album, how detailed? Uh, are the parts you give the guys or you know oh, what my albums you mean yeah what i do is i write the tune at home um i pro a lot of it till now all my records till now were heavily based on grooves so i would find a cool pattern or a riff or a groove whether it's a bass line or a drum groove or a rhythm guitar groove and i would record it in pro tools and then i would build the tune kind of around it and then once the tune is ready, the way we used to do it is I used to just give them a demo. It's a really rough demo. It's not good, but it will it will highlight the the chords, the the hits, the changes, all that stuff, the melody, and the basic idea of the groove. So I would say that ninety percent of my stuff, the bass lines and the drum grooves are, are stuff that I came up with, but they made it their own you know so it was just kind of an idea of hey this is the feel this is the vibe so this is pretty much what happens and then i used to play steady every every monday here in new york so i could i could try those tunes with different people and then when it was time to record i would know who's right for what you know like james genus would play on some stuff and will on some other stuff or like i don't know there's a bunch of other drummers here in new york that i use this guy rocky bryant and you know yeah yeah, I, I've seen on Facebook a couple of times recently, you seem to have a regular gig at the moment. Is that right? It seems like you're playing. Uh, no, not really. But I, I kind of, I'm trying whenever I can play, I try to play. So I, I usually would, let's say I play the 55 bar once a month and the bitter end once, maybe twice a month. That's pretty much, that's all really. It's you know, I, yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've been to the 55 bar for years, but um, that's a that's an amazing environment uh, for a visitor it's just great to go there and some, see some yeah, actually playing it tomorrow yeah all right yeah i've seen wayne krantz and mike stern yeah, yeah loads of times yeah. so when, when you started out i mean was it was it really difficult to get to a point where you could organize a band so you could like travel say you go to europe and far east or wherever well, when, I when i started out i didn't travel anywhere i was just playing locally right and when you play locally, you know, you just play with local guys and then you just try to get the better and better guys. You know, I somehow got lucky that I, I, I was able to connect again with Car Keith Carlock and I moved to New York at the same time. So we just connected right away. Anton Fig got into the mix really early on and then James Genus and Wee Lee. And then there's another drummer that's been playing with me on and off for as long as 
those guys is Rocky Brian. So between that group, I was able to build all my stuff, you know? And and once I started recording records, it was still pretty local. But then once you start releasing records, then you start to get booked in Japan or I haven't done that much Europe, but or US or Europe, you know, it just takes a while and you know, then you try to just get the best band you can. It gets more and more challenging over the years, but this is pretty much how it works, you know. Yeah, I mean, I suppose we're rebuilding everything after the pandemic, are we? I mean, yeah, I don't know. It's like, yeah, it'll be okay, but you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So when you when you travel, what sort of what do you take with you then? Gear, pedal. I take a guitar, a pedal board, and that's it. Right. I I rent amps. That's it. What sort of amps do you ask for then when you're on the road? Uh, um, my 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 first call would be a Vox AC30, but but only if it's the English version, not the cheap shitty Chinese. And if not, then a Blues Deville. But the problem with Blues Deville is that when you say Fender, they bring you those twin reissues that I hate. I can't stand. So I would try to just get a Vox, really, two yeah. Voxes or something like that. Yeah, it's a good bass tone, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, listen, Oz, I really appreciate this. I'm going to let let you get back to your life. But this man, thanks so much for taking the time to talk. It's, um, congratulations on the new record. Thank it's, you. Who's watching out there? You you got to check it out because it's killing, absolutely killing, as you'd Thank expect. You. I'll give you a shout when I see you coming over and uh, maybe come and do a workshop for us. Oh yeah, absolutely for sure. All, all the best, Oz. I'll see you again. Right, thanks, man. Bye.